Okay, folks, welcome to Lecture 2 of Unit 1, and today we'll be looking at more in depth at one of our scientific skills and looking at our powers of observation and being able to make observations in our lab. Now, one of the things that we want to consider here and just to review is remember that when we make observations, we are looking at our five senses, and those are the senses of tasting, being able to touch, being able to hear, being able to see, and being able to smell. And when we look at those senses, the one that we pretty much rely on the most in our labs and what we do is the, is the sense of being able to see or our sense of sight because we can gather a lot of information from being able to see. But one of the things that I also want to consider is we don't always want to rely on just one particular sense, especially in the case of sight when we look at optical illusions, we can actually be fooled by our sense of sight sometimes. So one of the things that I want to consider is when I make observations is that I want to use as many senses as possible because I'm going to get a more accurate picture of that particular object. And if you use the idea of being able to make observations about a dog, you know, and you see a picture of a dog in a book, you can get an idea of, you know, maybe the color and what kind of coat they have, but you don't actually or you're not actually able to hear the dog barking, you don't know if it's a high or if it's a low pitch, uh, being able to touch the dog if it's very soft fur or very wiry, uh, being able to smell what the dog smells like, and we might be able to consider how something tastes, but I don't think we want to taste a dog. So, you know, really what we want to consider is when we make our observations, if possible, we want to use as many senses as possible. Now, when we make these observations, we have two two types that we want to consider. One is a qualitative observation. And when we make qualitative observations, we're describing things. And we're just making general descriptions like things like maybe the dog has blue eyes, or the object is cylindrical in shape, or the candle has a smooth texture. These are just giving me descriptions, being able to use the sense of sight, being able to use the sense of taste or touch, and any of those types of, of observations. But the other type that we also have to consider is quantitative. And when we look at quantitative observations, this really, even though we consider this observation, this is more of when we look at being able to measure and being able to quantify matter and see how much of something we particular have, particularly have. So maybe we say something is five feet long or it has it weighs a hundred pounds, or it can be something as simple as just counting and seeing how many students are in a classroom. Now, when we make these numerical observations, observations, two things that we want to consider that we always have. We always want to have a quantity. We want to have a number, like 5 or 100 or 28. But the other thing that we want to consider in numerical observations in our quantitative observation also has to do with the unit and the unit that's going to go along with that. Because each of these units that I'm looking at here describe how much of a particular property I have. When I see something is 5 feet long, Long, I know that I'm talking, or feet here, I know I'm talking about length. When I look at pounds, I know that I'm talking about weight. And when I say students, I know exactly how many people or how many students that we have. So that's something that you want to make sure that in any type of measurement that you definitely include the units because it's those units that are going to express the property of that particular object, whether it's a physical property or a chemical property. So we can make both qualitative and quantitative observations in our, in our labs and in our, in our experiments. So something that we want to consider. So let's move on here. <laughs> Well, it's our favorite time of our, our notes here, and it's our brain break time. So maybe we'll get up from our seat and we'll do some jumping jacks. Uh, maybe we'll uh, do some triangle push-ups just to get the blood flowing. And today's Chuck Norris fact of the day, Google won't search for Chuck Norris because it knows you don't find Chuck Norris. He finds you. So in case you ever have to research, don't.
the whole look up Chuck Norris. All right, so moving on here. Now, when we look at these observations in scientific inquiry, we have to also consider what type of observations we have. Now, with that and those qualitative and quantitative observations, they're going to fall under what we refer to as direct observations. And these are observations using our five senses. But there may be times where we have to make indirect observations, things that we can't directly see. For example, the atom. Scientists were able to make observations about the atom hundreds of years before the scanning electron microscope enabled us to do that. So we base those indirect observations on other methods related to that subject to kind of get an idea of what that object is about. And a lot of you have done some indirect observations, maybe at holiday time, and shaking a box and trying to figure out what something is inside based on the information that you get from shaking it. Now, when we make these observations, observations, we a lot of times represent them using models. And models, just like what we make a model of an airplane or a model of a car, we use them to represent those indirect observations, where it's not exactly the exact object, but it's a representation of those objects. So these direct observations, including our qualitative and quantitative, as well as our indirect observations, allow us to get an accurate vision of that object or event. And it's very important that we're careful in these observations because when we do that, that's what they're going to help us arrive at the answer that we need to find or that we hope are able, able to find. Because when we, come, we use those observations and we come up with the answer, we come up with conclusions. And conclusions are basically an explanation of an occurrence. We have to kind of make the distinction between an observation and conclusion because an observation gives us more of an, uh, not an explanation, but gives us more of what uh, a description would be. And these conclusions explain that particular occurrence. And we use the observations, we use the data to be able to uh, support that occurrence. And as with anything, the more of them I have, the better it's going to be, the more concrete my conclusion is going to be. One of the things that we really don't want to do in our conclusions is we don't want to base things on one important word, and that important word is opinion. Opinion does not work in the scientific community. We want to make sure that we have data, we have information, we have those observations to be able to support our conclusion so we know exactly where we went right or where we went wrong. And this is something that we want to make sure that we consider as we go throughout the course of the year. So this is the end of our lecture for today, and as usual, if you have any questions, if you have any problems or concerns, please make sure you ask in class because these are what we're going to be using throughout the course of the year.